The track record falls. The kids on the pole. The heroes are back at the Rock. Officially, it is called North Carolina Motor Speedway outside Rockingham. Everybody in the business calls it The Rock. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Despain at the start-finish line here at this mile oval where tomorrow they'll wave the green flag and kick off the Good Ranch 500, the hubbub and hoopla of Daytona, our history. Now it's the week-in, week-out grind, the real chase for the Winston Cup Championship starts here. We're going to cover the weekend top to bottom and front to back. Let's kick it off with qualifying. Ricky Rudd was one of the first cars out, and Ricky was one of many who figured that was bad news, that the track would get faster as the session went on, and a later spot in the qualifying line would be better. Nonetheless, the tied Ford ran an impressive 157.052 miles an hour, and Ricky was smiling. We were about one of the quickest cars in practice. I think us and Gordon had run some 50s, and I told these guys if we can just get back and run a 50 again, we'll be happy. And we went out and ran a 30, almost two tenths quicker than we expected. I don't know if it'll hold up for the pole, but it's going to be up front somewhere on the first two or three rows, I feel like. And uh, regardless, we feel like we've got a car that's really driving good for the race. Well, Ricky didn't have to wait long for his pole hopes to evaporate. Jeff Gordon, who admits he always overdrives the corners at this place, tamed his exuberance long enough to run a 23.228 second lap. In other words, a new track record. The key, a pre-qualifying chat with crew chief Ray Evernham. We've been talking all day. I told him, you know, I know I'm driving in too deep. I know I'm driving in too deep, but, I mean, I'm just so stubborn-headed that I don't know how to let up and quit doing it. And we watched a couple cars run down in there, and, you know, Ray said, that's what you got to do. You just roll in there, and that's where we beat them. You know, I, I, I mean, I about had to kill myself to do it, but uh, I just, I eased off the gas going into one, rolled down in there, and when I sat on the outside front row, uh, the very first time I was here at Rockingham in a bush car, I did that, and I haven't been able to do it since. I finally got it back together today. Late in the session, one by one, the pole pretenders have fallen by the wayside, short of Gordon's new record. Brett Bodine manages an impressive 156.1 miles an hour, third fastest. But Rudd and Gordon, the only two over 157. Jeff's on the pole. Alan Bestwick talked to him. Dave, here's the man, Jeff Gordon. Jeff, you've set a new track record and really had to wait a while until you found out. Were you kind of nervous? Yeah, I really, uh, you know, I told the guys when I was sitting there, I said, boy, I hate going out early. I said, you know, all we got to do now is keep our fingers crossed and wait. And it's an uncomfortable feeling because you just know one of those guys are, are going to knock you off. And, and we really did want to go later to see if maybe we can may run a little bit faster. But the weather seemed to stay pretty much the same throughout the whole qualifying run. So, you know, as long as we came through at the end, then we're happy. But it, it, it I was sweating it a little bit. How different is the setup for the race from what you qualified? Well, it's going to be a lot different. You know, when you set up for one lap, I mean, you're going out there, that car can be on the edge for one lap, but when it comes to the race, you want it to be good on a long run, and, and you, you, you might start out, the car might not be comfortable, it might not be what you want, but as the laps go on, as the tires get older, as the fuel load comes out, that's when you want the car to be good. And so we're going we're gonna to be doing a lot of changing from now until Sunday. But, you know, this is the first half. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very gratifying to, to be able to sit on a pole other than at Charlotte. So this, this means a lot personally for me and the team. Good luck on Sunday. We wish you well. He's the pole sitter, Jeff Gordon. He'll lead him down tomorrow. All right, guys, take a look at your top 20 qualifiers. Some big names missing. We'll list them in a moment. A couple of Bodines in the first five. And your second five with John Andretti, Ricky Craven, Rick Mast, all with good qualifying efforts. Todd Bodine makes it three B-boys inside the top ten. Joe Nemechek with a good comeback after his crash at Daytona. And Rusty Wallace and Bobby Hamilton will start the race tomorrow just about as close together as they finished the one last Sunday. Today's second round qualifying involves extra pressure because Rockingham is one of those tracks with two pit roads. The 16 slowest cars have to pit on the backstretch. All right, let's go to the Telestrator. We have spared no expense to create this graphical representation of the rock. Front straightaway, start finish line, pit road, back pit. And Alan Bestwick to tell us why you don't want to be over here. 
This is supposed to be turn four of our diagram. Here. You are here. You're following the pace car there. He drops the leaders off onto pit road. Now, Elmo Langley speeds up a little bit in the pace car all the way around to here when he drops you onto the back pits. But while you're getting your service and coming out to join the field here, leaders have finished their service, and they've got the hammer down. Turn two all the way around to here, and that's faster than that pace car goes, and that's why they'll beat you to that point every time. That's where you're going to lose the track position only once, 1988. Neil Bonnet, has anyone won this race from the back pit road? Now, who's in danger of ending, ending up back there in trouble land? Listen to this list. Bill Elliott, Ted Musgrave, Dale Jarrett, Jimmy Spencer, Sterling Marlin. How about Terry Labonte and Daryl Waltrip? They were all slow in qualifying yesterday, and we'll take another shot at it today. One man who is not in that difficulty, of course, the Winston Cup champion, Dale Earnhardt. He gets to pick anywhere he wants. You can bet he's going to be over there. Here's what he had to say after qualifying 21st. We started, uh, well, I think we started, what, 30th down here in this fall or 20-something or something and ended up winning the race. So it's not a concern of mine for us com competition or how the car's going to run in the race. It's just getting in the race. I don't know. We run awful good here. And we just don't qualify that good. I don't know whether it's just uh, I can't hold my breath as good as some of these young guys can or what it is. Hey, no sweat, Dale. This guy's won three of the last four races at the Rock, started 10th or worse all three times. Rusty Wallace a little later, and NASCAR today, Daytona flashbacks right after this. Stay with us. NASCAR Today is brought to you by the 1994 NASCAR Year in Review. To order your copy, call 1-800-71-NASCAR. Hey, we're back on Pit Road at the Rock where the Bush Grand National cars will line up to go 200 miles in just a couple of hours here at Rockingham. Rockingham exactly the same as Daytona. It's exactly like Daytona, except in a couple of areas. Not quite as many people, not quite as much hype, not quite as much prize money. No seafood, no beach, but in one very important regard, this place is exactly like Daytona, and that is this. 175 points to win tomorrow, the same as last Sunday at Daytona. All the Winston Cup races pay the same in terms of the championship. That means they'll be going just as hard here tomorrow as they were last week. Let me follow up on a couple of Daytona stories. Remember the tire shortage, the scramble during the race, NASCAR and Goodyear trying to redistribute tires to make sure nobody ran short. Well, that has led to a new NASCAR policy. Alan Bestwick has the story. Well, actually, Dave, it's an old policy brought back. Last year, NASCAR used to count how many sets of tires each team took away from Hoosier and Goodyear to make sure nobody was hoarding tires. Didn't think they had to do that this year when Hoosier disappeared. Found out last week at Daytona they needed to. So now, before you can roll one of these sets of puppies away from Goodyear, the NASCAR official has to say it's okay. They want to make sure everyone has as many sets of tires as everyone else when we start the race. All right, thanks, Alan. Here's a video flashback to Daytona. A huge last lap crash last Saturday. Chad Little, who started dead last, squirts through and wins the Bush Grand National race. One week later, Little's on the BGN front row at Rockingham. The car's fast. Uh, this car's been fast everywhere we've taken it. It's probably our best race car we have. And um, we'll just have to, you know, hopefully hope to have some luck. Good pit stops and... Um, you know, what else can you ask for? Uh, this is the first race for Harris Teeter. Uh, you know, our, they do a, sh uh, a dual deal, a Bear and Harris, going back and forth. And um, so they're all excited. Uh, best I've ever qualified since I've been running the Bush Series. So um, got a lot of good things happening right now. We talked about the end of the year. We just wanted to keep the momentum going, whatever we could do to, to do that. And um, I think, you know, the way uh, Daytona ended was, was very positive because it didn't start out that way. Well, Chad's going to be in fast company this afternoon. He's got the defending series champion, David Green, alongside on the pole. Here's the rest of the top 10 qualifiers for this afternoon's 200-miler. Daytona marked the beginning and the end of Mike Chase's active motorsports deal. That ride goes to Jimmy Hensley beginning tomorrow. In the Daytona hubbub, we got behind on our correspondents. Let's check the mail. David Mayberry writes from Kansas. NASCAR today in its infancy is already better than its competitors. Thank you, David. If ESPN doesn't play programming roulette, yours should prosper and be a long-running program. And even if they do shuffle your schedule, 
as they have nearly every other racing program. Don't worry, we will find you. Are you listening up there in the programming department? David, don't worry, we're rock solid at 11 o'clock Saturday morning Eastern time. We're NASCAR today, and we'll have the Winston Cup point leader right after this. Back at Rockingham, and we send our condolences to the family of Sid Winningham, who had just signed on full-time with Junior Johnson, Jack Mann for Brett Bodine. He died in a traffic accident on Wednesday. Now, here at The Rock, we are reminded that only once in modern Winston Cup history has a driver won the first two races of the season. David Pearson, 1976. Last year, Sterling Marlin took a good shot at it, won the 500, came here, ran second a week later, and tomorrow, he'll get another try. Last Sunday's Daytona 500 win was Sterling second straight and the third in five years for the Morgan McClure Chevy team, prompting the question, who are these guys? Well, I'll start with the fact that they've come a long way in 10 years. Larry McClure, is it true you guys started with a one-stall garage, no racing experience, and jumped straight into Winston Cup? Well, that's true. I think we had two stalls, but uh, we had very few tools, and uh, I bought one race car from G.C. Spencer. I started with that, and uh, I hired Tony Glover a little bit later. And uh, it was kind of, a, we did it to just have some fun. Well, you know, we're always, we were in a car business and always dealt in, in automobiles, and it was kind of a natural for us. We had listened to races, but hadn't participated in any, and uh, just wanted to do it, you know, do it as fun. And we financed it out of, uh, out of our uh, automobile dealership, which was Morgan McClure Chevrolet. Hey, how about the time Mark Martin, one of McClure's early drivers, radioed a request to tighten up the stagger? Well, when he said that, I looked at GC and he looked at me. We didn't know what he was talking about. But anyway. <laughs> well, that was then. This is now nine wins, including three Daytona 500s. McClure says the key to his success is hiring good people. Tony Glover, for example, the only crew chief the team's ever had, he's good at ignoring harassment by his driver. Well, you know, it's been fortunate. You know, my dad taught me a lot when I was growing up, and I worked a year at Petty Enterprises, and I, I you know, I learned an awful lot that year, and, uh, you know, I've just been surrounded by good people. We got a real good race team here, and, you know, got, have had great drivers, and we got a great driver now in Sterling Marlin. With that, let's hear from the 500 winner, Sterling Marlin. You're as good as your last race, and yours was pretty good. Congratulations. I tell you thanks. Uh, all my thanks goes to Kodak, uh, Delco Bandit Race Team. They give me a, you know, they give me a great race car, and uh, what's sports enough to win the thing? Well, you know what they say about that black three in your mirror, though. You're supposed to get all intimidated and fall apart and let him pass you. And you didn't do that, did you? Well, I tell you, there's a lot of money on the line, and uh, you know, I don't lie with the race team. And uh, we had a real good race car in Daytona. Had a real good week, and uh, it'd be hard to go back and top that. Let me ask you about last year. You came here on top of the world, found your way back to 14th in the point standings, came back this year, won the 500 again. What are you going to do different for the long term for 1995? Well, we came to Rockingham last year, run second, left here leading the points. And uh, y'all thought we was going to have a real good year. We just had a lot of bad racing luck. You know, had some mechanical failures, caught up two or three wrecks, uh, run over some stuff, cut some tires down. Next thing I know, we're way back in the points. It's just... Uh, so what was going to happen, happen. It was by our control. Hopefully we don't do it this year. Sterling. All right, there's a guy trying to change his luck. Marlin will try to tie the Pearson record here tomorrow. This is the best letter we have received maybe since we went on the air. Ed Little, Santa Ana, California, accurately notes that the Super Bowl is boring and the Daytona 500 is exciting. So, quote, why do you and all the other media people continue to refer to the Daytona 500 as the Super Bowl of stock car racing? The 500 has been around longer than the Super Bowl. It draws a much larger crowd, and it is more exciting. Perhaps it would help the Super Bowl's boring image if we referred to it as the Daytona 500 of football. Ed, I love that. I wish I'd written that. I want to get Chocolate Myers on this television program. I went to Daytona, had my camera, tracked him down, and look what happened. We're back NASCAR today in the garage area at Daytona with Danny Chocolate Myers, gas man for the championship team. I told you a couple of shows ago we were going to try to put this guy to work, something called Chalk Talk. You ready to go to work for ESPN? Well, I'm ready to go to work, but the first thing we need to do is talk about money. Ooh, I was afraid that might come up. Well, let's talk about what you're going to do first. Let's talk about the kind of inside scoop you can give me from down here. Well, the more you want to know, the more it's going to cost you. 
I see. This man drives a hard bargain. You learned all that from Earnhardt. Tell me what I'm going to get for my money. I mean, give me a hint here. Give me some scoop. Well, all I can tell you is, you know, uh, when I went to work for Richard Childress, he promised me a couple of things, you know. He promised me that he could make me famous, but he couldn't make me rich. <laughs> now, he's lived up to part of that. He's made me pretty famous. But I'm going to let you guys make me rich. Sounds like we're going to have to talk a little business with this guy. You better go across the garage area to Alan Bestwick. Let me and talk uh, dollars here with Chalk. We'll have Chalk Talk on NASCAR today. Alan Bestwick, take it away. How many of these going to take? Well, and you, know, you know how much Earnhardt gets, and I think what I'm doing is just as important as what he's doing. You're talking serious money. Though. I'm talking big bucks, pal. <laughs> the negotiations continue. I promise you, we're going to get the guy. Hey, looky here. The Duke is back. The King's Kid is the driver. And on the other side of the break, Benny Parsons on Curtis Turner. Stay with us for more of NASCAR Today. We're back, NASCAR Today. Dave Despain on my way to Rockingham, reading my Winston Cup scene. Deb Williams writes the fascinating story of Kyle Petty's Rockingham race car, and I say, hey, I got to know more about number 42. This is the car Sabco Racing calls the Duke, as in John Wayne. It's won five poles and two races at Rockingham, and along the way picked up the biggest Unical bonus in history. But the Duke was subsequently sold as a show car. It disappeared until late last year when the team went looking for it as part of a back-to-basics game plan. We felt like it would be a big confidence builder if he could get that car back uh, for the team as well as Kyle. And that's what I'm saying, getting back to basics. We kind of, with all the changes that Pontiac went through last year, got out in left field. Every time they made a change, we made a change, and it was in the wrong direction. So the, the best avenue to take was go back to something that had worked in the past, and it was to find the Duke and rebuild it. And find the Duke they did, rusting in an Iowa cornfield. It was pitiful, you know. I asked Felix, I said, you sure you want to rebuild it? And he said, I'd really like to, you know, I'd like to have the car anyway. Uh, it's been really good to me. If it doesn't run good, I'll put it in a museum or something else. But uh, it was a challenge for the team, and uh, it ended up looking pretty good. We're glad we did it. I tell you what, the Duke was a long way from the pole yesterday. This car qualified 30th, and Kyle Petty did not want to talk about it. Speaking of 30th, it is the 30th anniversary of North Carolina Motor Speedway. This year, Benny Parsons is old enough to remember the very first race here, and he's going to reminisce about that with a famous friend. In 1965, the North Carolina Motor Speedway opened for the first time. I think it was the fall of 1965. Curtis Turner was the winner of the race. Leonard Wood, the chief mechanic. It was You were called chief mechanic back then, right? Right. Now we're called crew chiefs, but... Tell us about that very first race here at Rockingham. Well, I can remember, you know, uh, Curtis came in one morning and the uh, race before was at Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, somehow or another, he broke his rib uh, due to the seat brace was uh, sticking him in the side when he hit a big bump down there or something and uh, broke his rib. And he's complaining about his rib. And uh, so I had to make a pad off the roll bar to rest against his shoulder but he drove that race with a broke rib. Curtis Turner, when we talk about race car drivers, a lot of folks compare Curtis Turner to Dale Earnhardt. Would you compare him? You know, no disrespect for any race driver, but of all of the race drivers I've ever worked with, had the pleasure of working with, nobody had the control of an automobile like he had. I mean, he had full control no matter if he was on the fence, if he was halfway upside down or what. I mean, nobody probably will believe this, but the man was just, he could just seem to pick a car up and set it in a hole that he, that he wanted to. Curtis never complains about a car. He never complained about the handling or anything. But I remember he came in, he told me to come over, and he says, uh, how about putting some shocks on this thing? So I put some shocks on it, a little stiffer for him, and uh, he come down here and won the race. After four years being away from the racetrack, in his third race back, Curtis Turner wins the very first race at Rockingham. All right, thank you, Parsons. Why was Curtis Turner out for so long? Tried to organize a driver's union. Big Bill France didn't like that, put him on the sidelines. 
I've got time for one more quick letter. This is from David Vile. David is in Georgia, and he says, I would like to submit the following question for your weekly show. At super speedways, teams will occasionally use a higher gear to gain a slight advantage on restarts. Is that ever successful, or is it a high-risk gamble? David, I think you've confused us with that other show where you send in a question, they go get the answer from a crew chief, and then they send you a T-shirt. First, you don't use a higher gear. You use a lower gear to gain an advantage on the restart. Second, yes, it is a bit of a gamble. Lower gear means higher RPM. You could blow up the engine. Third, we don't do T-shirts. We do, however, pass on good wishes to Rusty Wallace. Lady in Michigan says, when you see Rusty, tell him, go, go, go. I'm going to do that during the commercial and talk to Rusty Wallace right after the break. Hey, we're back at the Rock, and when you come to this place, you want to talk to this man because three of the last four checkered flags at this place have fallen on Rusty Wallace. But i got to go, I got to do some old business with you before we get to the good stuff. Okay. Daytona, you had some harsh things to say about Bobby Hamilton. I heard there had been some backlash about that. Week to cool off, time to look at the replay. You still feel like maybe you were wronged down there? Yeah, I was. I, uh, I... I think the fans need to understand that when you go down there with the problems I've had in the last three or four races down there with the, all the wrecks and all the stuff, that you uh, really get pretty frustrated when something like that happens again. I mean, I looked at all the tapes, I looked at all the stuff, and I'll tell you what, it's a racing deal. It was two guys going for one hole. I never saw him over there, and Bobby never thought I was coming up. And uh, he tries to slow down and gets the thing sideways and gets in the back of me when that happens, but still, if I'd have known he'd been there, I'd have gave him more room, but I didn't know it was going to happen. I generally try not to talk and run that trap, but uh, I did it, and I, I apologize for it. I take it back, and I hope all the fans won't hope I'm a, a bum for what I said because <laughs> I'm mad enough to admit that, you know, I don't like to talk like that, and uh, if, if it's frustration, let me tell you what. If you don't think it's tense in a Daytona 500, just get on down there one time. I heard that, and I know you guys hate talking about last week because the race you want to win is the one tomorrow. Why the success at this place? Why have you guys been so good here? We've just had real good chassis setups. We've had good pit stops. We've worked very hard in our shock absorber combinations, uh, air pressures, a lot of things that make this track special to us. I've won here with different cars. Uh, a lot of people know Midnight, my favorite car, which I have here this time, but I've won here with different types of cars also, so it's just not that one car. I think it's just a, an outlook that I know how to get in a corner. Now, I've never qualified well here, but I seem like I always race pretty good. Now we want all the secrets. We've got videotape of a lap, and we want you to talk us through it. Okay. Tell us why you do so well here and how you do so well here. You know, it looks like we're going down into turn one here right now. It's just turn one is a corner that you've got to get in the thing real easy. You can't get in real, real steep, and you can't get in it real hot, because if you do, you slide up the track. And turn three is the same thing. This is one of the tracks that you go to where if you charge a corner, you're going to slide up the corner. So you got to charge all you can for qualifying, but when you race it, but you got to get it in easy, pick the throttle up quick, and you got to keep it down low in the corners. Now the hardest part of all, make me a prediction for tomorrow afternoon. When said is done, who's going to win this thing? Gosh, I'll tell you what, you know, I've had a bad run at Daytona, and every time I come out of there, I seem like I win this thing. So, you know, i got to predict that two January draft cars going to win. But, you know, the only problem i got is that i got 42 other guys think they're going to, too. So, man, I just hope I do. We'll see what happens. Rusty Wallace, winner of three of the last four. And guess what? We've done it again. We're out of time. Let me very quickly give you our new address, Post Office Box 5774, Athens, Georgia, 30604. That for the lady who said she watched the show three weeks before she could get it all written down. Quick reminder, next week we go to Richmond, Virginia, and do it all over again. Dave DeSane for Alan Bestwick. This is The Rock. We're gone. <laughs>